So in our today's class, I want us to start with the thought. What is a thought? We will say that a thought is any civil wrong. A thought refers to any civil wrong. So we will be discussing what is the meaning of a thought, and then what are the elements of a thought? What are things that constitute, or what are some of the components of something so that we can say that it is a, it is a thought, this civil wrong. And then from that, we will also discuss what are some of the uh, general defenses in thoughts. Is that okay? Because we will say that a thought is a civil wrong, meaning that you need to know how can you defend yourself if you are told that you have committed this civil wrong. And then after that, we will now go to the specific thoughts. When we go to the specific thoughts in our syllabus, we need to know the first one being negligence. We need to know what is negligence, elements of negligence, and then the defenses of negligence. And then the other one, defamation. We also need to know what is defamation and the elements of defamation and then the defenses of defamation. Then after that, we also need to know the aspect of trespass. Trespass. Do you know that, that uh, today you are passing through a certain uh, pathway and then tomorrow there is no path? No path. <laughs> I'm trying to use the, the normal, normal <laughs> uh, language. No way here, no way through here, such words. Eh? Trespass. It is committed through that trespass. The other one, there is a recent uh, legislation by the government and most of the county governments that we do not want to hear noises from the churches. We are we are crossing some bus, we are crossing some churches. No, not churches, they sit the bus only, senior. And they were saying that it is because we make a lot of noise. Senior. So what is that thought that those bus commit? That thought is known as nuisance. Is that okay? So we will be discussing the four main thoughts, negligence, defamation, trespass, and nuisance. Those are the four main, and then that topic will be over. So we can start by defining what is a thought. Thought. <clears throat> and we can say that a thought is refers to any civil wrong refers to any civil wrong other than the breach of a contract refers to any civil wrong other than the breach of a contract refers to any civil wrong other than the breach of a contract and, and we can say a person who commits a tort a person who commits a tort is known as a tort fisher. A person who commits a tort is known as the tort fisher. And you can say another point where two or more persons where two or more persons jointly commit a tort, where two or more persons jointly commit a tort, two or more persons jointly commit a tort, they are known as jointly commit a tort, are known as joint tort fissures. Two persons committing a tort are known as joint tort fissures. Joint tort fissures. That is the first thing that we need to know. Let us ask ourselves, what are the functions or objectives of the law of thoughts? Functions, functions or objectives 
of the law of thoughts. The law of thought. This civil wrong, what are their functions? Why do we have a law that is governing civil wrongs? One, one we can say, to be uh, to determine a right. To be uh, to determine the rights, to determine rights between parties to a dispute. To determine rights um, between parties to a dispute. Between parties to a dispute. Do you know why we are saying that? Because when we will be discussing the law of uh, negligence, where we will be saying that, yes, you ought to have committed this thing. You ought to have done what a reasonable man should have done. That means that we are saying that this is your right as a reasonable person. And then the other person will try, uh, will try to tell us, no, for me, I think this is uh, my right and this is the other person's right. So this one, it gives us the rights between parties to a dispute, more so disputes concerning uh, civil rights or the civil law. The other one? The other one, you can say, to prevent continuation, to prevent continuation, okay. to prevent continuation or repetition of a harm or repetition of a harm to prevent continuation or repetition of a harm. How, how do we do that? It's by issuing injunction. By issuing injunction. The other one? to protect certain rights recognized by the law to protect certain rights recognized by the law to protect certain rights recognized by the law recognized by the law which are some of these rights that the law of thought tries to protect? That uh, a right of a good reputation of a person. That is why we will be discussing defamation. That if you try to injure the reputation of a person, then these are the consequences. So those are the things that you are saying you are protecting certain rights recognized by the law. The other one? To protect intellectual property protect intellectual property, to protect intellectual property. And the last one we can say, and the last one, to maintain peace and order, to maintain peace and order, in the society, to maintain peace and order in the society. Now let us answer a question in the ATD paper where the examiner asked, distinguish, distinguish between a thought and a crime. Ten marks. Distinguish between a thought and a crime. Ten marks. So we can draw the table. Thought. On the other side, we have the crime. Thought. And then on the other side, we have the crime. We can say for the thought, 
it is an infringement it is an infringement infringement of the civil rights this one is an infringement of the civil rights the civil rights belonging to an individual infringement of the civil rights belonging to an individual the other one we can say it is the breach of public duty it is a breach of public rights and duties breach of public duties and rights of the whole community. Is that true? That is what we said is the meaning of a crime, right? That you are breaching the law against the state. That is what we said in another, uh, in our introduction classes. The other one, you can say parties involved in the criminal cases, parties involved in the criminal cases are, who are the parties that are involved in the criminal cases? Who are the parties? Huh? The accused and the prosecutor, correct. Parties involved? In this crime, are parties involved are the state prosecutor or state prosecution and accused. So on the other side, because we have said that it is a civil law, so the parties involved are defendant and uh, the chief and the defendant. Chief and the defendant plaintiff and the defendant. Standard of proof for a tort? What are the standard of proof for a tort? Balance of probabilities, correct. Standard of proof. Standard of proof. Standard of proof. is the balance of probabilities. Uh -huh. The other one? Standard of proof? Beyond reasonable doubt. Standard of proof is beyond reasonable, beyond uh, reasonable uh, doubt. Standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. Then the other one, you can say the main object of the the main object um, uh, the main objective of the thought the main objective actually you can say the main objective main objective of the litigation, litigation of the tort is to compensate, is to compensate the injured party, is to compensate the injured party. The other one, the main objective of the criminal litigation the main objective of the criminal litigation is to punish the criminal persons. The main objective, main objective of the criminal litigation is to punish 
is to punish the criminal persons, is to punish the criminal persons in the interest of the society, is to punish the criminal persons in the interest of the society, in the interest of the society. <laughs> to punish in the interest of the society. The other one you can say, the proceedings, the proceedings of the crime, the proceedings of the crime are conducted by the state the proceedings of the crime are conducted by the state. The proceedings of the crime, this one's proceedings of the crime. I'm sorry. Proceedings of the crime. Are conducted by the state. And then the other one. The proceedings of the tort are brought to court. The proceedings of the tort are brought to court by the injured party, are conducted by the state, conducted by the state. This one, the proceedings of the tort are initiated or brought by the court or brought by the injured party. So those are the differences between a thought and a crime, the differences between a thought and a crime. I also want us to distinguish between a contract and a thought, distinguishing a contract and a thought. Let us distinguish between a contract and a thought. Distinctions between a contract and a thought. Distinguish between a contract and a thought. So on one side, contract, and then the other one, thought. This one can also be asked as distinguish between the law of contract and the law of thought. Is that okay? So that one should not worry you that, uh, you can say for the contract, We can start with the contract. The parties fix the duties themselves. For the contract, the parties fix the duties themselves. Themselves. Parties fix the duties themselves. Here, the duties are fixed by the law. Duties are fixed by the law. Can we agree on something? What is the meaning of this point? Parties fix the duties themselves, and then the other one is the duties are fixed by the law. What do you mean by that? Try. What do you think is the meaning? Duties are fixed uh, by the law. The other one is that the parties fix the duties themselves. My people are suffering. It 
means this one for the contract. Remember what we said when we were discussing the law of contract, that we as the parties, we are the ones who will agree that do this and then I will do that. Can you remember the doctrine of precise and exact? The doctrine of performance that you do this and then there will be the consideration. So it is the parties themselves. Remember we said that a contract is an agreement between parties. The agreement between parties with an intention to create legal relations. So the duties that we have on one another is ask them ourselves that we will fix. But when you come to the thought, the duties are fixed by the law. It is the obligation of each and every person not to injure the reputation of another person. That is something that has been stated by the law of defamation. It is not us, but the law of defamation. So the duties are fixed by the law. The other one, we can say the damages of a contract, damages of a contract may be liquidated Liquidated, liquidated, or unliquidated, unliquidated, and then this one the damages are always unliquidated. What did you mean? Is uh, what do you mean by this? Are always unliquidated. What do you mean by that, Majesty? What do you mean? What, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Okay. What did you say, Zemini? Can you remember when we were discussing the? What did you discuss this? When we were discussing. Many very nice, very, very nice. We were discussing uh, the concept of breach of duties, breach of a contract. And we say that in case of a breach of a contract, one of the remedies for a breach of a contract is awarding of damages. Can you remember we, we categorize them into two, common law remedies and the equitable remedies. Where we said for the common law remedies, one of it is the Damages, where well, we say that damages refers to monetary compensation. And then from the monetary compensation, we discussed five types of damages. There was one liquidated, where we say that it is a fixed sum, fixed sum of money in a contract, that in case you breach this contract, this is the fixed sum of money that we will, you will compensate us with, liquidated, unliquidated. It means that it is left to the court so that it can determine the damages to be awarded or the, the, the sums to be awarded to the injured party. Is that okay? So unliquidated means there is no specific amount and therefore the court is the one that fixes the sum. Senor. And then we also discuss the nominal damages. Very nice. The other one? We can say uh, the other difference in contract, the duty is owed to, in contract, the duty is owed to the parties to a contract. Duty is owed to the parties to a contract. The parties to a contract. Uh huh. Well, this one, we always say that the duty is owed to all persons generally. Duty is owed to all persons generally. What do you mean by that? The duty is. What did we say is the duties owed only to the persons to a contract? That one is the doctrine of 
privity of contract. Senior, that only the parties to a contract, this duty that you have, it's only to those parties. The other one is duties to pass all persons generally. Everyone is expected to respect the law of thought. Then the other one, we can say, the last uh, we can say, for the thought, The remedies for the tort, uh, we can say that remedies are few. For the tort, remedies are few. For the tort, remedies are few. While the other one, remedies. On, on the contract side, the remedies are many. On the contract side, the remedies are many. So those are some of the distinctions uh, between the law of contract and um, the law of thought. From that, let uh -huh. ah yes, yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What did you say is the meaning of a contract? Legally binding agreement between parties that is enforceable by the law. No. A legally binding agreement that is enforceable by the law. Then the other one, what about the tort? We have said that it is any civil law. Question, outline the elements, outline the elements, outline the elements that constitute a tort. Outline the elements that constitute thought. What are the elements that constitute a thought? You want to say, we can say, outline the elements that constitute a thought. So we are asking ourselves, for us to say that there is a civil wrong that has been committed, you must prove certain things. And that is what we want to answer. We can say, for the thought to exist, for the thought to exist, for the thought to exist, three things must occur. Three things must occur. Three things must occur. So these are the answers. The answers one, a wrongful act, a wrongful act, or omission by the defendant, a wrongful act, or omission by the defendant. By the defendant. You can briefly explain and say the act complained of, the act complained of should be legally wrongful. The act complained of should be legally wrongful as regards to the party complaining 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 the other one 
is what we call the legal damage. The other thing that must be there is what we call the legal uh, damage. Legal damage. You can say it is the violation refers to the violation or infringement violation or infringement of the legal rights of the legal rights of another person violation or infringement violation or infringement of the legal rights of another person, of the legal rights of another person. We can briefly explain something small here and we can say that uh, the legal damage depends on two principles. The legal damage depends on two principles. The legal damage. Legal damage depends on two principles. Which are the two main principles? We can say one, injuria sine damna. Injuria sine damna. Where we can say it is said that. It is the infringement of a legal right. It is in infringement of a legal right. Infringement of a legal right of the plaintiff. Infringement of a legal right of the plaintiff without any, without any actual loss. Without any actual loss. In spite, uh, without infringement of a legal right of the plaintiff, without any legal loss or damage, without any legal loss or damage. Uh, that is the injurious in uh, damnum. We always get it from what we call a case we call Ashby. Though these ones, they are not tested, um, but it is important for you to know. Ashby versus White. Let me explain something. Eh? So that um, we are saying that uh, for the tort to exist, there are two things. We have already discussed the first one. The first one being the wrongful act. You must have committed something that is affecting the other person's right. Then the other thing is that the legal damage. Why we are saying that the legal damage is the violation of the legal right of another person. You are trying to interfere with the right of the other person. But we are saying that this one depends on two principles. We will be discussing the law of defamation and we shall say sometimes it is not a must for you to prove that you have suffered that damage. This is what we are saying now. For us to prove, uh, or for us to explain the concept of damaging or violating the uh, rights of another person, we depend on two principles: injurious sine damna, meaning that you don't, you have, um, you don't, your legal right has been infringed, but you have not suffered any loss. What happened in this case? This white is a returning of was a returning officer at that time. Mr. Hoyt was the returning officer. This one, Ashby, was a registered voter. He had applied uh, for registration as a voter in his constituency. However, Ash, uh, the white person, the returning officer, failed to register Mr. Ashby as a registered voter. So what happened? Ashby did not vote. 
although the person that he wanted to vote won. But then he went to court and said, even though the person that I wanted uh, to be voted in won, but for me, I was not registered as a voter. And therefore the court held, yes, your right of voting was infringed, although you did not suffer any loss because your vote or the candidate that you wanted was also voted in. Is that okay? So that is what we are saying. So the meaning of injurious in a damnum, it means you can just write it here up, injury without damage. Injury without damage. It means injury without damage. You have suffered, yes. Uh, there is an injury. You are, you are right for voting has been infringed, but the person that you wanted to be voted in has been voted, and therefore there is no loss that you have suffered. Is that okay? Injuria sine damnum. Inju injury without damage. The other one is damnum sine injuria. The other principle is damnum sine injuria. Damnum sine injuria. Now, that means damages without injury. Damages without injury. This one you can just write it, it's damages without injury. Uh -huh. Why I want us to explain damages without injury. Why I want us to explain and say that it occurs where a person has suffered an actual harm, a person has suffered an actual harm without any violation of his legal, without any violation, without any violation of the legal rights. I've said that you are suffering a harm without suffering, uh, without any violation of the legal rights. The common, the common uh, case that we refer here is the mogul extinction. Mogul extinction. Company Limited versus MC Gregor. I have said that this one we are just discussing them for you to understand. These are the things that can be tested. You differentiate them, but the cases, they can't. But it is important for you to know them. So what we say, what happened in this case, the MC, the Mogul Steamship Company Limited, we have given this principle. The second one is that you are suffering damages without injury, meaning that you are suffering some losses, although there is no legal right that has been infringed. What happened? is that in this, uh, there were four ship companies that came together and they wanted to drive away one of their competitors. So what they did, because all of them were, 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 were conducting these ship services, they decided to lower their prices as compared to their competitor. So what happened? Yes, so many customers came to them uh, to conduct their services using the four ship or the, the four team members, and the, the main competitor suffered some losses. And therefore, this competitor went to court. The, he went to court that these people are having some malicious transactions. They want to steal my customers. The court said, yes, it is true. We can see that you are suffering some losses, but there is, any, there is no legal right that has been infringed. Are you together? So yes, you are suffering some losses, but there's no harm or there's no, sorry, there's no legal right that has been infringed. Now, uh, from that, um, we can discuss the concept of uh, 
malice in thought. Malice in thought from, oh, sorry. We have not discussed the third uh, element. The third element is the legal remedy. The third element for thought is the legal remedy. The legal uh, remedy. For the legal remedy, I want you to say that it is there. It is the compensation. It is the compensation. It is the compensation or remedy. No, it's not compensation. It is the compensation for the damages suffered the compensation for the damages suffered by the innocent party. The compensation for the damages suffered by the innocent party. So that is the, the 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 remedy. Now, before we go to uh, what I had said on the malice, we are saying that uh, the innocent party, this wrongful act and the damages, they will always give to a remedy. The innocent party has suffered something and therefore they must be compensated. I want us to discuss the liability in thoughts. Liability in thoughts. Let us discuss the liability in thought. The liability in thought. This one I will start by a question that I want you to go and research. I want you to go and search liability in thought. What is the meaning of that liability? Zoom here. There is nothing like. Uh, what is the meaning of liability? Accountability. Who is the person who will be held accountable in case of a thought? That is what we want to answer. Who is that person who will be held accountable in case of a thought? So we will say, I want to I want to start with a question that I want you to check in relation to thought, in relation to the law of thought, in relation to the law of thought, distinguish, distinguish between, distinguish between oh, absolute liability and vicarious, vicarious liability. I want to discuss vicarious liability for the absolute liability. That one I want you to go and check. What is the meaning of uh, those terms? So let us uh, discuss vicarious liability. I want you to go and check what is the meaning of absolute. Vicarious liability is a very common area of examination. Vicarious liability. It refers to the liability of one person. The liability of one person. The liability of one person for the wrongs committed, the liability of one person for the wrongs committed by another person.
first the liability of one person for the thoughts for the thought committed or for the wrongs or acts committed by another person. That, that is a question in your paper. Define the term precarious liability. You are being held liable uh, for the thoughts or acts committed by another party. Is that okay? For example, an employer is held liable for the wrongs committed by the employees, e.g. employer is held liable for the wrongs for the wrongs committed by the employee for the wrongs committed by the employee also we have also discussed the law of agency is that true did you discuss something like that Please imagine. Mm -hmm. At Miss Maji, for the, the acts of the uh, the agent, the principal will be held liable. So that is the um, vicarious liability. We can say that it is founded. It is founded upon two principles. It is founded founded upon two principles. This vicarious liability is founded upon two principles. The first one is let the superior or master be responsible. Let the superior or master be responsible. And then the other one, he who acts through another. The second one is he who acts through another. He who acts through another. Does act. He who acts through another. Does act. He who acts. Through another. Does act. Meaning that uh, if I am a master and I give some duties to the servant, that I am also uh, performing those acts. Senor, he who acts through another. A master delegating his authority to the servant is also acting those activities. So that is what we mean by that. Common question, question. Explain the conditions for vicarious liability. Explain the conditions for the vicarious liability. For the vicarious liability. The conditions for the vicarious liability. We can say one, one, there must have a master servant relationship. There must have a master master servant relationship. Some books will tell you, some books will tell you 
they must have an employer employee relationship that is very much okay is that okay the second one you can say the employee must have committed the thought or the wrong the employee the employee must have committed the thought must have committed the thought or what we say as the wrong and then the that one we can say the thought must have been committed the thought must have been committed the thought must have been committed in the course of the thought must have been committed in the course of employees employment in the course of the employees employment the thought must have been committed in the course the thought must have been committed in the course of employee what have i said in the course of employee employment thought must have been committed in the course of employee employee employees employment that's a very common question it's a very very common question on the aspect of the conditions of the vicarious liability. The other one uh, that we need to understand is what we call the occupier's liability. The occupier's liability. Occupier's liability. occupiers occupiers liability we can first write then i will explain occupy it's their uh, liability of an occupier of premises liability liability of an occupier of the premises an occupier of the premises for damages for damages done for damages done to visitors to the premises premises liability of an occupier of the premises for damages done to visitors to the premises what do you mean by this before we continue and before somebody gets confused we are saying uh, we are discussing the accountability and when we are talking of the accountability, we are now coming to another type of liability in thought known as the occupier. Occupier here, we are talking of something we call the premises. What is the premise? What is the meaning of a premise? Like this building. It's a premise. So we are saying that we are talking of accountability of an occupier. We can just first explain what is the meaning of an occupier. Just talk of an occupier, an occupier refers to any person, any person 
who has control over premises. It's any person who has control over premises and has a duty of care and has a duty of care towards those persons and has a duty of care towards those persons who lawfully come into the premises, who lawfully come into the premises. Who lawfully come into the premises. So in other words, we are saying an occupier can either be an owner or a tenant. You can say that an occupier can either be the owner or a tenant. An occupier can either be an owner or a tenant. So what we mean uh, by this, we are saying that uh, generally an occupier is any person who has control over these premises. If it is this building, the person who has control over this building will have a duty to reduce or we have a duty of care towards any person who is entering. I want to give a good example. Have you gone to these banks when somebody is sweeping Amamutumanyana mob? What is that thing that is placed there? Sweep and leave. So, <laughs> yeah. so what happens? Uh, you have some uh, sign in Yinakwanyesha that is. Yes. Ama, it can say that cleaning in progress. That one is what we call the occupier's liability. Is that okay? They have a duty of care towards a person. So what will happen? What if Richard comes in and therefore he steps uh, and falls down and you are sweeping or washing or uh, mopping that floor? Do you know that I have a right to take you to court and you have to compensate me, senior? So that is the reason why they issue that uh, sign. So when you talk of this occupier, any person who has control over a premise will have a duty of care towards a visitor. So what is the meaning of a visitor? Let us give the meaning of a visitor. So that uh, please ensure, if that question comes to your exam, you see there you have left here. <laughs> the visitor, because I will give you an assignment and I want to see how you will answer uh, that question. A visitor it refers to any person, any person who the occupier, not who, whom, whom, any person whom, any person whom the occupier has given permission whom the occupier has given permission uh, the occupier has given uh, permission to enter the occupier has given permission to enter the premises is that okay person who has been given permission. Now, what happens? What if it's a po police? I'm a, uh, people from the KPLC, they have come to your home and they want to disconnect. Do they have a, a, a permit? Do they have permission to enter into those premises? What do you think? Majesty, they are saying no. <laughs> Not, they have the permission. Not at times, they have the permission. Any lawful person, 
any of person who has the authority to enter into your house, the police to conduct any search, they do not need to ask any permission. I'm using that because you will find a question that is saying that the police can enter into the house and then they suffered some harm. They were beaten by a dog. Who is that person who will be held liable there? Who will be held liable? The occupier. Because it is the duty of you to protect or to have a reasonable duty of care to any visitor who enters your premises. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, Miriam, whether you want to say yes or no, that is the correct thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Warrant? Uh -huh. I am not getting what you are saying. Nini mnaele wa chanyana visa? Nini? Oh, such warrant. You're asking for the such warrant. Or permission. They don't ask for permission. They want to give you. They don't ask, like, uh, come... Uh... Oh, but they show you the warrant. Yes. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. Therefore, if these local persons, if they enter that premise, see, that means that they want to give you this search warrant, but they are there. <laughs> they entered in that premise. So you have the duty as the occupier to show the duty of care towards those persons. We can just give something, provisions. Provisions of uh, Occupiers Liability Act. Provisions of the Occupiers Liability Act. Provisions of the Occupiers Liability Act. I want to, when I am answering this question, I want you to go through the CPA, CPA CS question, November 2017, November 2017, question 1B. CPS, yes, November 2017, question 1B. What are some of these uh, provisions that are governing the occupier's liability? CPS, yes, people. The provisions governing the occupier's liability towards the visitors. One is what we call the common law duty of care. Common law duty of care. Common law, duty of care. Where well, we can say it means it refers taking care, or the occupier should take a reasonable care. Just start it. The occupier should take a reasonable care. The occupier should take reasonable care in all circumstances, in all circumstances, to ensure the visitors, to ensure the visitors, to ensure the visitors are reasonable safe, to ensure the visitors are reasonable safe when using the premises, when using the premises. Nelwana, that is the first thing. The first provision that governs these occupiers, you have the common law duty to ensure this visitor is safe. However, there is a common thing that we can now go to. What are the defenses of this? Defenses of this occupier's liability. Defenses. Irian, you are confused. Yes, I mean. Uh -huh. You are asking yourself why we are saying provision, then you go to defenses, right? Amma, what is the issue? 
Mm. No, uh, it is still in a provision under the occupier's liability. I'm just simplifying for you so that when you'll be answering this question, you'll be able to answer it. What I'm saying, the first provision that governs this occupier's liability is that you have the common law duty of care. But what will happen? Now we want to ask ourselves, what are some of the things that will show that the occupier had taken the common law duty of care? So what are some of his defenses so that he can show that he did this uh, duty of care? Is that okay? So that is what we are now using. So the first one, warning, use of warnings. Use of warnings. I'm a warning the way you want to. You can say the occupier may be discharged from liability. The occupier may be discharged from liability if he gave sufficient warning. If he gave sufficient warning. Concerning a certain danger in the premise concerning a certain danger in the premise concerning a certain danger in the premise for example beware of a slippery uh, beware of beware of yeah yeah uh, sunny has just spell it for me and therefore we have it on the board is that okay second one yes please mm -hmm. warning yes 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 it is yes i am saying that there's a danger that can happen in that uh, and that is the main reason i am happy now you have understood what you mean by this occupiers that is the main reason. So if you are bitten by that dog and I had given that sign, then that means that I escape. I will be discharged any liability. The other one, independent contractor. We are about to discuss the independent contractor. Independent contractor. Independent contractor. And you can say that the occupier, occupier may escape liability, may escape liability in respect of any damages, in respect of any damages cost to the visitor, in respect of any damages cost to the visitor. The occupier may escape liability in respect of any damages caused to the visitor if occasioned, if occasioned by the fault. If occasioned by the fault of an independent contractor. By occasioned by occasioned by the fault of an independent contractor. For example, works or maintenance of an independent contractor. For example, works or maintenance of an independent contractor. Sunny. Very nice. Very? Very nice. For example, works. For example, works of an independent contractor. Then the other one, we have I hope that only we will be discussing an independent contractor. What is the, what do you think is the meaning of an independent contractor? What do you think? I, I am just asking a simple English question. What is the meaning of an independent contractor? A person who is in charge of. Mm -hmm. 
and repair. Yeah. Repair of our premises. Uh -huh. Another, <laughs> we come from the same B. We come from the same village. So we will be discussing who is that independent contractor. But this case, a person who is act acting on his own terms of service. So, independent person. He's working on his own terms and conditions. Then the other one, contributory negligence. Contributory negligence. The occupier is not liable if the visitor contributed to his own injury. The occupier is not liable for if the visitor contributed to his own injury. How do we say that the con the, he contributed to his own injury? Yeah. yeah. We come from what you have said. <laughs> come from the same village. Contributor, uh, contributory negligence means it is what you will be discussing, known as the volunteer and fit injuria, meaning that somebody is doing a risk. Um, how, how can I frame it? How can I frame it? Uh, I have shown you that this is a slippery floor and then you are still running here and there and then you fall and then you get injured is that okay that is something that you contributed to your own to your own what injury <laughs> so the visitor <laughs> the visitor caused his own injury the last one Trespasser, I'm a trespass. The last one is trespass. Trespass. Occupier does not owe a duty of care. Occupier does not owe a duty of care to trespassers. Trespasser. Trespassers. Trespassers because they do not have permission, because they do not have permission to enter in that premise, because they do not have permission to enter in that premise. So please ensure you try to answer this November 2017. It is just testing this thing. Is that okay? Person suffering some damages because of this occupier liability. The other liability is on the liability of an independent contractor. Liability of an independent contractor. It is in the ATD paper where the examiner has tested on the aspect of, yes, yes, the third one, the third one. Uh -uh. It is the one that common law duty of care is the main provision governing the occupier's liability. But it is always important to note that uh, for example, this contributory negligence, there is what we call an exception, which is that exception in case it involves minors. So if it's a child who came and played in your house, even though you had put a sign and everything, and then they fell down, the occupier will be held liable. You want to say that uh, it is So the main thing that is being tested in November 2017 is that occupier's liability. Let us answer a question in the ATD paper that is asking now that that liability being independent contractor. Independent contractor. 
independent contractor. The third one, okay, I have written. No, the other liability under tort. The first one you have discussed, vicarious liability. The second one, occupier's liability. The third one, independent contractor. independent contractor. Let us start by defining what is the meaning of uh, an independent contractor. Define an independent contractor find an independent contractor, I want to dictate and say it refers to any person, a person who undertakes, it refers to any person who undertakes to produce given results, any person who undertakes to produce given results without being controlled to produce given results without being controlled on how he achieves the result. On how he achieves the result. A person who undertakes to produce a given result without being controlled on how he achieves the result. You can, you can say they are down. He uses his own discretion. What is the meaning of discretion? What is the meaning of discretion? Freedom. He has his own freedom and power. Um, and therefore, he uses his own discretion and therefore, the employer or master, the employer or master, the employer or master is not liable for the torts committed, is not liable for the torts committed by the independent contractor, committed by the independent contractor. We have understood the meaning of an independent contract, right? It is in the ATD paper. Right? The examiner has asked you to define the term independent contractor is using his own ways or terms to achieve a certain objective. He does not have any person who is controlling them. Now, there's a common question, outline the exceptions. The exceptions of the rule of independent contractor, outline the exceptions of the rule of independent contractor. This can also be asked as circumstances where the employer, circumstances where the employer, circumstances where the employer, the employer, is held liable for torts committed by an independent contractor. By an independent contractor. By an independent contractor.
one where the employer retains his control where the employer retains control over the contractor's work where the employer retains control over the contractor's work and personally interferes and personally interferes with the work and personally interferes with the work and personally interferes with the work the second one the second one when the thing contracted, when, is it when, where, where the thing, where the thing contracted, where the thing contracted in itself, the thing contracted is in itself, is in itself, is in itself. <laughs> Even if you are uh, self at thought. What do you mean by that point? Because I can see everybody. <laughs> what do you mean by that point? That even the contract that we have entered or this activity that the independent contractor is achieving, it's an civil wrong. It's a civil wrong. That is what you're saying when the thing contracted is in itself a thought. Another one, where the independent where the independent contractor is engaged to perform a duty, where the independent contractor is engaged to perform a duty that is likely to perform a duty that is likely to cause damage, that is likely to cause damage to other people's property, to other people's property or cause nuisance or cause nuisance or cause nuisance. The thing contracted to be done uh, or where the, the independent contractor is engaged to perform a duty which will cause damage to other people's property or it proved to be nuisance. Then another one, you can say, where the independent contractor, the independent contractor is engaged to perform where the independent contractor is engaged to perform a duty that is dangerous, a duty that is dangerous, a duty that is dangerous or extra hazardous, extra hazardous, dangerous or extra hazardous. And then the other one, we can say, the other one, we can say, statutory duty where the work to be done, statutory duty where the work to be done, statutory duty where the work to be done, is a duty required by law, statutory duty where the work to be done, Is a duty required by the law that the employer is under a duty, that the employer is under a duty to inspect work, that the employer is under a duty 
to inspect work on a continuous basis to inspect work on a continuous basis and failure to do so and failure to do so and failure to do so the master will be held liable and failure to do so the master will be held liable And then the last one, where there is strict liability, where there is strict liability, where there is strict liability without proof, strict liability without proof, of negligence without proof of negligence. We will be discussing strict liability, very common in your papers. The strict liability gives us a new case that is now common and that you need to know. The Rerans versus Fletcher case, we get it from the strict liability. So those are the three or the main liabilities under the tort. The last part under the general defenses you should remember that we have not done any specific thought. We have only been discussing the general thoughts and their liabilities. Let us now discuss, let us ask ourselves a question. Describe the general defenses. Describe, describe the general defenses in thought. Describe the general defenses in thought. 10 marks. Describe the general defenses in thought. 10 marks. That is a common question. Describe the general defenses in thought, 10 marks. Describe the general defenses in thought, 10 marks. When you talk of the general defenses, what do you mean by that? It means, what do you think it means? Yeah. You know, you are uh, giving the vibes of <laughs> uh, <laughs> my people are suffering, yeah? Yeah. The first one we can give, it means these are some of the defenses that you can claim in any thought. Are we together? So we will be discussing the specific thoughts. Some of them, you will find them that they will be in various specific thoughts, meaning that these are the defenses that you can claim in, in any of the thoughts, provided that it is applicable in that thought. So it is a defense that can be claimed in any of the specific thoughts, provided that it is applicable in that thought. The first one, volenti non fit injuria. Volenti non fit injuria meaning voluntary assumption of risk volenti non fit injuria meaning voluntary assumption of risk voluntary assumption of risk. And you can say, you can say, a person cannot complain for uh, of harm done to him. A person cannot complain of a harm done to him if he consented to run the risk. If he consented to run 
a person cannot complain of a harm done to him if he consented to run the risk if he consented to run the risk in other words you can say it where a person uh, chooses to carry out an act that is risky so if there is any harm that will come out of that uh, situation then you cannot claim any uh, damages you cannot come to court saying that you want to be compensated there's a common question what are the conditions for volunteering and fit injury conditions for volunteer non-fit injury conditions for volunteer non-fit injury conditions for volunteer non-fit injury one the print the plaintiff the plaintiff the plaintiff was at the material time the plaintiff was at the material time aware of the nature and extent of the risk involved the plaintiff was at the material time aware of the nature and extent of the risk involved Then the last, the other one, or the second one. The, uh, the plaintiff agreed to incur. The plaintiff agreed to incur the risk voluntarily. agreed to incur the risk voluntarily that is the condition there is also the aspect of limitations of the uh, defense of volenti non-fit injury what are the limitations when can we not apply it when can we not apply it one no unlawful act. No unlawful act can be authorized by consent. So, in other words, it means where there is a, where the act in it's unlawful, you cannot claim the defense of volunteering and fit injury. The other one. In case there is breach of statutory duty, in case there is breach of statutory duty, and then the other one, it does not apply to cases of negligence. It does not apply to cases of negligence. The other one, we have the second defense, inevitable. <laughs> yeah. The second one, inevitable accident. Inevitable accident. Inevitable accident, we can say, it is where an injury an injury is caused to a person, an injury is caused to a person by an accident, by an accident that uh, which cannot be prevented, by an accident which could not be prevented, 
which could not be prevented despite despite reasonable care on the part of the defendant. I repeat, it's an injury caused to a person by an event that could not be prevented or avoided despite reasonable care on the part of the defendant despite reasonable care on the part of the defendant. The other one, act of God. The other defense is act of God. Act of God, then we can say, it's where the damage is caused where the damage is caused by natural circumstances, where the damage is caused by natural circumstances, and connected natural circumstances, and connected, and connected natural circumstances, and connected with human beings which no human beings can prevent, which no human beings can prevent. For example, floods. I want to give a question here that I want you to test, outline the circumstances. It is a question in the ATD paper, the circumstances. where one can raise, where one can raise uh, the defense of act of God, the defense of act of God. The fourth one, necessity. The fourth defense is necessity. Necessity. You can say that for the necessity, it refers to when a person finds himself in a position, a person finds himself in a position whereby he is forced to interfere, whereby he is forced to interfere with the rights of another person with the rights of another person so as to prevent harm so as to prevent harm to himself to himself or his property so as to prevent harm to himself or his property The other one, self-defense. Self-defense. Where we can say, it is where a person where a person has the right to defend himself. A person has the right to defend himself. Property and family, a person has the right to defend himself, property and family from unlawful harm, from unlawful harm. I also want you to check what are the circumstances or conditions. Question the conditions of self-defense. Please check assignment here, conditions of self-defense. When can you raise that defense of self-defense? Obviously, the first one is you should not use excess, uh, excessive force. Then the other one, acts under statutory authority. Acts. 
under statutory authority. Act under statutory authority. You can say where the it refers to where the commission it is it refers to where the commission of a person commission of an act not a person commission of an act is authorized by a statute is authorized by a statute even though it may result to injuring even though it may result to injuring injuring innocent parties yes authorized by the statute authorized by the statute i've said it is authorized by the statute and even though correct even though it may lead to injuring of an innocent party meaning that will be compensated so those are some of the defenses the other one you can add the contributory ne negligence contributory negligence the contributory negligence So we can say it is where the plaintiff is also to be blamed. The plaintiff is to be blamed for his own suffering. The plaintiff is to be blamed for his own suffering. Also here there is a question on what are the circumstances to prove. You can check the circumstances to raise the defense of contributory negligence circumstances to raise the defense of contributory negligence. So that is the end of the the plaintiff is also to be blamed of the suffering that they suffer, of their own suffering. That is the end of the first part of the law of thought the general thoughts. In our next class, we discuss now the specific thoughts, the negligence, defamation, trespass, and nuisance. So that is what we'll discuss in our next class.